All right, well, the Formula One season is well and truly upon us with the 2021 championships underway now this weekend in Bahrain. Watch every race of the 2021 F1 season exclusively live on Sky Sports F1 and now as well. And I'm delighted to say it. I'm joined now by Formula One pit lane reporter with Sky Sports F1, Ted Kravitz. Ted, thanks a lot for joining me. Hello. Yes. Uh, nice to see you. Um, nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to a, a fellow Irishman. I, I hear this. I heard a rumour on the grapevine that uh, you have very strong Irish links. My grandfather was uh, was born uh, just off the uh, just off the south. Is it the South Perimeter Road? The South Circular Road? South Circular Road, yes, yes. In Dublin. Um and uh, he was born there and he's Irish. My father has a, is Irish and, and I even have my Irish passport. So there you go. There's my, uh, there is my Irish passport. The so uh, yeah, the no, I'm, I'm, I'm a little known fact. I'm, uh, I'm actually Irish citizen. Oh, excellent. Well, it's a good, uh, good to speak to a fellow Irishman then, live <laughs> yeah. from Bahrain. So uh, the weather isn't <laughs> yeah. quite the same over here, but <laughs> yeah. we, we'll deal with it. Um, Ted, I, ju- I wanted to start, I guess, on, on the... On, on, a bit of a somber note, I guess, but we had the sad news this month of the the passing of Formula One broadcasting icon Murray Walker uh, at the age of ninety seven, and really, really sad day for the sport and someone who kind of brought the sport into everyone's living rooms over the last decades. But how do you put into words Murray Walker's legacy in the sport of Formula One? Well, he made. I don't think there's any question. You know, sometimes you do get broadcasters, and you know, as, as as presenters, as broadcasters, as commentators, as journalists, you know, we're sometimes on the periphery of sports. But there have been some broadcasters who have made the sport as popular as 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 as, as, as the sports have become. And Murray Walker, you know, is is one of those people. I guess you could say. You know, in rugby, you've got Bruce McLaren. I guess you could say Richie Benno in cricket have always sort of done a lot to to popularize the sport but Murray Walker over the space of you know 40 years 50 years plus in the commentators hot seat um did that and and it was his voice and his enthusiasm and his knowledge his passion so many ways to describe what it was that made him so attractive to to the fans but for me the voice was a large part of it it was a V6, a V8, a V10, a V12 style voice. And that cut through the engines and uh, really helped him communicate his, his passion for the sport. Yep, he'll, his legacy will be one that, you know, people still want to watch Formula One. And there's still, there, are, there are still some drivers um, whose names, when you hear them read out, you hear them in a Murray Walker voice. It's Alain Prost, you know, for me. <laughs> just um, that will be uh, that will be his legacy. But yeah, what a great man. Sadly, missed. you spoke as well after his death. I think uh, you know about how he seemed to have almost this childlike innocence about the sport. That you know, he had that almost awe uh, every time he spoke, uh, every weekend about the sport. Is that is that you think how he managed to to connect to so many viewers, you know, around his broadcasting that he, maybe he made the sport approachable to people who weren't really experts. I think you just couldn't help but be caught up in his enthusiasm. Let's say, you know, you were watching it, you had to get up for a championship decider at five o'clock in the morning. You know, Murray always made you feel that you were right there with him. He was sharing the excitement and the sort of childlike in, in enthusiasm and innocence was, was that sometimes he didn't really expect to see, you know, the, 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 the selfish world of the racing driver where they might do anything to win you know he sometimes thought that wasn't on um uh, but that was just his you know, the, the way he thought they should go about things but i guess when he was growing up his hero was always tazio nuvolari we always asked him about him and we said who was it murray you know your your heroes well i had a soft spot for Juan manuel fangio and of course i knew sterling moss very well but my hero was always tazio nuvolari the flying mantuan um, and, and he'd tell us about you know, what it was that he found the swashbuckling uh, qualities that he found attractive in, uh, in Nuvolari. And so in his day, you know, drivers had maybe a little bit more respect for the, the, the dangers that could happen to them. It's a much more dangerous world in motor racing. Maybe they gave each other a little bit more quarter on track. They were still competitive, don't get me wrong. But um, I think maybe he expected some of that uh, you know, esprit de corps would come into the likes of Ayrton Senna and, and, and when Senna ran Prost off the road or Schumacher got up to some of his, you know, um, single-minded, let's call them, uh, antics, I think Murray some, some, sometimes disapproved. He sort of wanted to think the best uh, of people and he was disappointed sometimes when uh, racing drivers 
uh, only looked out for themselves rather than sort of more sporting way. But, you know, there's a past generation. Um, but uh, I think that's what I meant by, you know, he had he liked to, he maintained a sort of innocence about some of the racing. Yeah, an extraordinary legacy. Obviously, our thoughts with Murray's family and friends this month. Uh, what, what a legacy in the sport uh, Murray Walker has left. Um, uh, for yourself, Ted, being a, a pit lane reporter then in, in Formula One, I mean, in my mind, it must be like being a, a New Orleans correspondent in Mar- Mardi Gras. It has to be a, this kind of insane, uh, fairly unpredictable way to make a living almost. Um, well, to, to paraphrase Murray Walker again, um, Formula One makes itself unpredictable because it finds a way to reinvent itself year after year. And you would have thought, you know, coming into a, another year of supposed Mercedes dominance, you know, we might think, oh, well, same old thing. Um, but it isn't. And then Formula One does find a way to reinvent itself. And in, in, in that respect, um, I guess it is uh, the unexpected because you know, this year we, we don't know. I mean, we'll f- soon find out, but it looks like uh, certainly in, in Bahrain, if anything's to go by, that Mercedes are not now the, the dominant feature going and the dominant force going into, into the, uh, the season and that Red Bull Racing and the, the immense talent that is Max Verstappen will have something to say. Uh, about it but um yeah the race is uh, very soon live on sky sports so you'll see you'll find out whether hamilton can win uh, a fifth world championship i like the way you describe it yeah that they're like being in in uh, in new orleans for mardi gras and it is like that you know every race every event is like a it's like a sort of fa cup final or a uh, a world cup maybe not quite as big as a world cup final maybe that's overselling it a bit but it's like a you know it's a major sporting event world sporting event uh coming to these to these countries and um in, in that respect yes you you're you're part of a, a big show um uh, drive to survive season three came out recently and for anyone who didn't see the first two seasons it's it's an extraordinary inside look into the world of formula one and uh, the characters and personalities involved. I saw you spoke to, to the uh, Haas team principal, Gunther Steiner, quite recently about the, the season three release. And I know he said he hasn't seen it yet, any of it. But uh, have you noticed yourself, anecdotally even, an uptake in, in interest in Formula One for maybe people who perhaps had no interest or little interest in the sport before they, before they watched the series? Oh, definitely. I've had, I've had people from, uh, from the States who are friends of my family who've, who've always kind of known that I've been in this, you know, what is this Formula One type thing, who've watched it. And, you know, a lot of the Drive to Survive is kind of tailored towards a, a lay audience, a, an American audience, the, the amount of sort of exposition they go into, the amount of explanation they go into and, uh, and bringing up the sort of stories and rivalries of the past. It's necessary to, to bring these guys in. I don't think it puts off any of the, any of the fans, the, the regular fans who are like, yes, 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 you know, I know all of this. Um, get to the inside action because it's so rich on that inside action uh, as well and the behind the scenes. And, you know, we try to do a lot of that behind the scenes uh, ourselves. I try to do a lot of it on on my sort of notebook feature. Um, and I'm sometimes turning the tables on them <laughs> as I did uh, in the testing notebook when they were following George uh, Russell around. And I was like, okay, well, let's let's show Let's show behind the scenes at the people who are showing behind the scenes. See what I mean? Um, I don't know whether they, they like that or not, but, you know, we're all trying to show this behind the scenes. Someone should probably show the scenes. I guess they show, they're shown every weekend, aren't they? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great programme. Um, we're showing Series 1 and 2 again uh, on Sky Sports F1 uh, in its entirety throughout, uh, throughout the uh the last few weeks and the next few weeks so it's it's fantastic and it has brought formula one to a new audience you know, people i know parents at my kids school who uh, who say oh you know i saw you on netflix the other day it's like so that's what you do it's like well yeah that kind of is what i do but um no it's uh, it's all good stuff there was a, i think there was a great line from uh, from kevin magnuson at the start of season two i think it was uh, just before the australian grand prix in 2019 and he was saying you know the first race is like in spring when the cows are let out for the first time and everyone is just madly excited. Do, have you got that sense from Bahrain this week that even though it's a strange uh, year, I guess, again with COVID, that there is that real, real excitement around Bahrain this week to get the season underway again? There is. And I would, I would say um, at this point, you know, we, we miss being in Melbourne. I'm sure Melbourne misses being the season opener. That's always... Um, a sort of it combines with a sort of shock to the system from a European 
winter going into what is effectively uh, the Melbourne, the Australian autumn, uh, as they go into the, our summer, which is of course their winter, there is a shock to the system that, 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 that really sort of gives you a kick and makes you think, oh, wow, you know, the season really uh, has um, started or the cows have waken up, woken up in Kevin Magnuson's um, phrasing. And, 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 you know, we hope we can get back, to Melbourne hope they can get back to, to the hosting bigger international sporting events with a big crowd. And that's the big thing. Uh, for them, even though they do, of course, host the Australian Open, um, and Bahrain will have a crowd there, which will be which will be good. And um, they host such a great such a great Grand Prix. Um, you know, the the organisation is 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 immaculate uh, in Bahrain, and the the racetrack is very good. I almost wish we were doing two races there. I kind of missed the. We're not going to have the Sakir Grand Prix afterwards with that. Uh, with that uh, very, very different outside layout. Um, I kind of want to see another race there, um, but because uh, it created a surprise last year, didn't it? With yeah. Sergio Perez winning. Something different for sure. Um, just to dive into some of the talking points then ahead of this uh, season, and you've, you've mentioned Mercedes already, and uh, certainly the gap you would hope from, a, I guess, from a neutral's perspective that it will be narrowed. Um, and, you know, Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes have had a bit of a monopoly over Formula One in recent years. But, uh, you know, there are some tweaked regulations this season. Can you maybe maybe explain to people what those uh, regulation changes are, what they might mean for, for narrowing the gap between Mercedes and the rest? Yes, well, the, the FIA, the powers that be, decided that um, speeds... We're getting a little bit out of hand and and just to keep a cap on the car's speeds not only for the driver's safety but also to protect the tires which you know if, 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 if they push the speeds and push the downforce they'll only have to push up the pressures on the tires they we had a do you remember there was a british grand prix or a race at silverstone where uh, lewis hamilton finished with a deflated front tire and, and we've had a couple of failures so just to to, to protect the tires they cut the downforce they did that by cutting away a bit of the floor in a critical part um, of the car's uh, floor to make to generate rear downforce, and um, that appears to have worked against the way Mercedes like to run their car, which is to work that part of the floor just in front of the rear tires very very hard. It, it, it creates a lot of downforce just in that area. It doesn't look like very small. It's a sort of ten millimeter, sorry, ten hundred millimeter, ten centimeter uh, bit that they've nibbled out of the floor. But it's the way that Mercedes used to work that bit to generate downforce that is disadvantaging them compared to the way someone like Red Bull or Ferrari or McLaren run their cars, which is to effectively jack up the rear of the car um, to use the whole of the car's uh, underside as a kind of downforce generator. It's like a diffuser accelerating the airflow underneath the car and getting it uh, to be quite quick, to go out quite quick. Uh, increased flow velocity, they call it, um, out the back, which sort of sucks down the back of the car to create rear downforce. And so it looks like if you know, Mercedes are to have a harder time of it, it's because of these rule changes. Um, so they're going to have to find a way of overcoming that. And, and they can't just change their car's concept and go to a high rate car. That's not the way it works. And it's not worth it anyway, because we've got this new uh, era of Formula One cars with an increased ground effect, these rude new rules coming out next year. So it would, wouldn't really work. So Mercedes just have to make do with what they've got. So the big question for the season is whether they can. You mentioned Red Bull there and, and you know, Sergio Perez, of course, replacing Alex Albon. Bit of a shock move uh, there from Christian Horner. But uh, then you have Max Verstappen heading into his fifth year with the team. Um, and they've looked quite impressive in testing, it has to be said. But uh, would it be Red Bull that, that would be the closest challengers to, to Mercedes? And could they even maybe pose a bit of a shock this year and push them all the way? I think with the exception of someone, a team like McLaren, um, who've had a very good preseason and Bahrain, his first race, uh, always suits the McLaren. They could have uh, a good uh, season and, and maybe even uh, score a win. They got very close with a couple of podiums uh, in Bahrain and Monza last year. So uh, with the exception of McLaren, I think it will be uh, Red Bull Racing. The Honda engine is is improved this year uh, by 20 horsepower or so. It's Honda's last year in Formula One, perhaps forever, and they want to go out 
with a world championship if they can. And Red Bull have learned, it's taken Red Bull a season to sort of sort out last year's car. And I bet they're glad that the rules have changed so that you effectively use most of this carryover of last year's car with the changes that we've already spoken about because they finally understood how to make their car tick. And as you say, Verstappen is a machine. And I think he can sense a weakness in Mercedes that he can exploit. He, he can sense that the rules haven't worked to Mercedes' favour. There is going to be potentially a weakness there. Won't be a weakness in Lewis Hamilton. He's as motivated as ever to, to win an eighth world championship and to make history. But if Verstappen can you know, smell some kind of opportunity, he'll be right in there. You mentioned McLaren there and, and someone who I, and a lot of others, I think, fell in love with on Drive to Survive was Daniel Ricciardo. Um, I think one of the seasons started with, with him coming on screen and just saying, I'm back and I'm still really good looking, which, is, which kind of sums up Daniel Ricciardo's character. But now he's, of course, with, with McLaren um, alongside Lando Norris. So a nice mix of uh, youth and experience really there in the driving mix up for, for McLaren. Um, and I know they have that Mercedes, Mercedes engine as well for the first time in, in six or seven years uh, this season. So uh, quite an exciting, quite an exciting prospect for McLaren this year. And as you mentioned, you'd expect a number of podiums at least for them this season. Yeah, I mean, you'd expect and, and hopefully they can deliver that. Daniel Ricciardo, winner of seven Grand Prix. He knows how to win races. Um, and if the opportunity presents itself, you know, he will be there. But that's going to be such an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Is Ricardo coming into Lando Norris's team? Um, will he be able to just dominate that environment with a big smile and, and you know, a, some sparkle in the eyes? Will Lando Norris get a taste of, of the Ricardo qualifying speed that we all know is there, as well as the racecraft? Or will it be the other way around, where actually Lando Norris uses you know, the, the tricks he's learned about how to, how to press the right buttons at McLaren and be able to, to put some shade on, on Ricardo. So, yeah, that is a really, really fascinating driver lineup dynamic between the two. And if you like, we'll get a measure of, of really how good Lando Norris is because we knew he was as good as Carlos Sainz. They were sort of more or less level on qualifying, weren't they? In fact, I think Lando was one qualifying up on Science last year. And we know when Science was with Verstappen, they were pretty much level, more or less level uh, with each other as well. So we, we're getting an idea that Lando really is you know, a quality operator and we'll get a good measure on Ricardo. That's, that's what I love about when drivers move teams is that you really can start to get a sort of measure on how good they compare to everybody else. And to refer to your earlier question, we'll get a measure on Sergio Perez, won't we? On, uh, on how good he is compared to Verstappen. Yeah, absolutely. All interesting dynamics for sure. Mm. Um, a lot of kind of novice onlookers in Formula One will, maybe for historical reasons, keep an eye on, on the prancing horse and the red livery of, of Ferrari. Um, a disappointing sixth uh, for them in the Constructors' Championship last season. But do they look like they can maybe improve on that this year, do you think? They can improve. I mean, I think I did a prediction um, over testing that they'd be a uh, top, four, top four car. I think if they can get in behind... The top three in McLaren, they'll be doing well. Um, Aston Martin looked like the old racing point looked like they might have a trickier season than than last year when they uh, took inspiration from from the 2019 Mercedes. I think now they have to go by themselves. They might find going a little bit more difficult. Although considering there's a large amount of carryover from last year, they shouldn't be too bad. So I think that place around about McLaren, Ferrari will be very keenly fought. Ferrari will be there. I think staying six in the constructors would be a very, very poor result for them this year, and nobody expects them to be there. The engine is better. The chassis is a little bit better, a bit, only a bit, according to uh, Charles Leclerc, his words. Um, so they just need to get going from there. But they're also going to be focusing on the new Formula One for 2022. That's next year. They've devoted a lot of resource to that, and uh, they think that's the best opportunity they've got of getting back to championship winning um, position. And, and so we might have to wait another year or so for Ferrari to suddenly be at the top of the, uh, the podium winning races again. But it's frustrating, isn't it? Because Charles Leclerc, another driver, we all rate very highly and we want to see um, him winning some more races. And, uh, and so Carlos Sainz, the Charles and Charles show, as I like to call it. Um, of course, Carlos, Spanish for Charles. Um, and uh, at Ferrari, we want to see them uh, doing well, but I think they're both in it for the, for the long haul, which they'll need to be. 
one person, of course, not with uh, Ferrari anymore is, is Sebastian Vettel. Uh, and, and he's with uh, Aston Martin, of course, on their return. And I saw you had a very interesting discussion with Sebastian about cheese, I think it was, um, in, the, in the pits quite recently. Quite an interesting character, a funny character, Sebastian Vettel, I think you'll agree. But uh, what, what Sebastian Vettel do you expect to see with Aston Martin? Will it be the, the Seb that we've seen kind of struggle over the last couple of, couple of seasons? Or will it be the, the world champion Sebastian Vettel that we all know he is? I think definitely the latter. Um, he's released, he's relieved, he's at peace with what happened at Ferrari. It was a big dream to equal what his hero Michael Schumacher did there. Didn't work out. It went sour at the end when the team told him they didn't really want him around anymore. Um, I think he was he was sad towards the end of last year. But he's at peace with that decision now. He's gone to a team a, a more like Red Bull where he won those four world championships. You know, a British-based, no-nonsense, down to a engineering team of racers. I'm not saying by implication Ferrari isn't that, I'm just saying it seems to be that kind of environment, a bit more like Red Bull Racing where Sebastian Vettel learned his craft and was so successful, successful. So he seems happy there. He just has to get to know the car a little bit better. He can drive it, he says, that's absolutely fine. He just needs to know the little tricks that you can play with it. So um, he's gonna take a couple of uh, races to really get on top of that car. But you know, I wouldn't put it past old Seb. You know, he knows what it's like. He knows he can't win a Grand Prix in the first uh, few corners. He'll be there at the end at some of these crazy races where the Red Bulls or the Mercedes aren't there to take advantage. And I wouldn't put it past Vettel winning a Grand Prix for Aston Martin. Top of step of the podium in sort of British racing green. And, um, you know, yes, the cheese-shaped wedge uh, of, the, uh, of, of the cutout of the floor might not have worked in Aston Martin's favour, considering it's you know, a car inspired by the Mercedes, just like it's worked against Mercedes, but Seb will be there and he looks a much happier driver this year. He didn't really get my um, cheese explanation as to what I was trying to explain with the, uh, I thought I explained to it quite happily. It was a, you know, there is a triangular sort of cheese-shaped wedge that you're not allowed to put bodywork in and that's cut the downforce. But he said I should have drawn it on a piece of paper, which I didn't think was very, particularly exciting way of uh, explaining it to him but he was right at least the piece of paper would have stood up in the Bahrain heat rather than the, the cheese which which really didn't you did your best Ted you did your best for sure yeah. um the, can I just ask you about the the well there's the psychology of a, of a Formula One driver and you see so many young drivers on the grid at the moment but I just want to take you back to to November and and that horror crash involving Roman Grosjean and, and, and the halo equipment likely saving his life in that and I saw a video recently of, of you, it could have been the night of or the day after the crash and, and you're at the crash site and describing this harrowing scene. And I think you, you said the smell was something like almost like a, something from a house fire. Um, what are your memories of covering that? How strange was it to cover something like that? Luckily, of course, Roman made it out OK with just minor injuries and minor burns. But what was that experience like for you to cover? Yes, I had, a, uh, I had a discussion with my colleague Craig Slater on Sky Sports News. He said, oh, why did you describe it like a house fire? Have you had a house fire? I said, well, I, I'm, I'm lucky not to enough touch wood not to have had a, a house fire. Although uh, there was a fire in my school when I was, when I was growing up and, and we all went past it the next day. Oh, and, and there was this smell of burning sort of everything. And that was, you know, smell is a very evocative sense, isn't it? And, and we're all sort of taken back there. And the, and the moment you, I smelt that, that was the first thing that came into my head. There was burning carbon fiber, there was burning rubber, um, there was singed metal, there was, you know, fuel that, and oil that had, that had burned. And it just seemed to me the best way of communicating um, the emotion of what that was. And it was just the, the wreckage, you know, and that was the strange thing. Sometimes when you get, Motor racing accidents, there's a lot of wreckage strewn everywhere. But there wasn't in Roman Grosjean's case. It was all confined to that bent bit of metal. And just seeing, it was quite a thick bit of metal, these arm coats, got to be a few millimeters thick. Um, and just to see the energy that must have been absorbed by that bit of metal and thinking that there's a human in the middle of that, that was really what was the most shocking thing. And even though the halo had, protection devices cast titanium which is you know as we know pretty strong metal um it it just punched a hole right through that steel barrier and that was the most shocking thing and it was so amazing to see that he actually walked away with that just with the burns that he did to his uh, to his hand and 
you know, I wasn't in favor and I wasn't a, a, a fan. It's not true I wasn't in favor. I wasn't a fan of the Halo when it first came in. I think many people weren't. They thought it took away some of the danger, some of the appeal, some of the gladiatorial aspect of the Formula One. But my goodness, were we all wrong on that one? Um, and uh, it was, it was, it was shocking at the time. And that was only, that was the, the, the same evening. So that must have been when I went out uh, to the crash site. Um, as soon as the race was finished and everyone was started to pack up, Craig and I, with a camera, head out to the to that site. So uh, the Haas mechanics, I remember, were still dealing with the the uh, the energy recovery system battery that was still smoking. It was still essentially on fire. Lithium ba batteries don't aren't able to to be put out very quickly, and they actually had to. I asked Haas when we were there a couple of weeks ago for testing. So it isn't one of your, isn't the battery still here? And they said, well, actually they had to bury it in the sand. They had to dig a hole in the sort of desert somewhere near off the circuit and bury the lithium battery because it was just still smoking and it was volatile. And so, yeah, that just tells you the, so the, the ferocity of that incident. Yeah, terrifying experience for sure for all involved. I uh, just glad Roman came out of it okay. And um, uh, you've been very good with your with your time, Ted. Just to finish up, then, um, I, I want to ask you for your predictions for the upcoming season because who knows in this day and age what's going to to materialize. But what do you hope to see? What sort of surprise packages or things are you looking forward to most between but this weekend in Bahrain and of course December twelfth in Abu Dhabi when when the season finishes up? Well, I mean. Uh... I hope to see a titanic battle between Max Verstappen, who is the natural successor to Lewis Hamilton. You know, we had we had Senna, then we had a Schumacher, and then we had Alonso, and then we had well Button and Raikkonen. But then after Alonso, there was Vettel, and after Vettel, there was a Hamilton era. And Verstappen is the sort of natural successor to Lewis Hamilton as far as eras we think are going to go in Formula One. So I'd like to see Hamilton battle with Verstappen. But, you know, I'd like to see history made. And, you know, as they say on Sky Sports, it only happens once. It will only happen once. The history is made and Lewis Hamilton will become an eighth, uh, eight time world championship or win his eighth world championship. So, just for history's sake, it's never been done before. And I was there the year after Michael Schumacher tried to make it eight. And it never happened for him. Fernando Alonso came along and won two on the bounce. And then Michael left Ferrari. And that was kind of it. So um, I think it can be done. There's something about the mythical eighth world championship. You know, maybe it can't be done. Maybe Hamilton's, maybe the Mercedes car won't be up to it this year. And Verstappen will get in there and win one before Hamilton can win eight. And who could? Who knows what's going to happen after that? Will Hamilton win eighth at all? Well, I don't know. There's only one way to find out. That's to follow it with us on on Sky F1 and uh, and watch every race live because anything can happen. Maybe there is something myth mythical about eight world championships. I haven't thought of that before. What do you <laughs> think? It all remains to be seen. It's a, it's a, it it's a scary thought. Seen. Maybe it's a barrier that can't be crossed. But, That's um, right. Maybe it's a barrier that can't be crossed. Good, good way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, listen, Ted, you've been great with your time. And, and as, as I mentioned at the start, you can watch every race of the, the 2021 F1 season exclusively live on Sky Sports F1 and now as well. Ted Kravitz, Formula One pit lane reporter, you've been excellent with your time and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the season ahead. I will. Thanks very much.